I'd like to call to order the Clive City Council meeting of May 25th, 2023. Would the clerk please call roll? Mayor Edwards? Here. Council members Klein? Here. McCoy? Here. Judkins? Here. Weaver? Here. McElhinney? Thanks, Mayor. Here. Got it. Would you all rise and join us in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Next, we have approval of the agenda. I'm not aware of any changes. Approval. Second. A motion second to approve the agenda. Further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, like sign. Our agenda is approved. The next item on our agenda is a proclamation declaring National Gun Violence Awareness Day on June the 2nd. Hope Johnson and some of her friends are, are here and had asked that we declare that as we've done in the past. Um, most of the council have heard the uh, proclamation before in prior sessions and it's also available in the packet. So I'll just focus on just the introduction and the last few clauses uh, since everyone can refer to it by reference. So uh, this proclamation declares the first Friday in June to be National Gun Violence Awareness Day in the city of Clive to honor and remember all victims and survivors of gun violence and declare that we are, as a country must do more to end this public health crisis. Whereas by wearing orange on June 2nd, Americans will raise awareness about gun violence. And whereas we renew our commitment to reduce gun violence. Therefore, be it resolved that the first Friday in June, June 2nd, is declared to be National Gun Violence Awareness Day. Signed this 25th day of May, 2023 by John Edwards, the mayor. So thank you, Hope, for bringing that to our attention. Next item we have is our citizen presentation. And Pete, do we have anyone online tonight? This is the opportunity for someone to appear before the council on an item that is not on the agenda. And just as a reminder, since we do have quite a few folks here, I'll tell you what our operating principles are. We support the pillars of character counts, endeavoring at all times to promote and model the principles of trustworthiness, respect, responsibility, fairness, caring, and citizenship. In conducting our work, we expect everyone to act in a respectful manner consistent with these principles. So do we have anyone online, Pete? Yes, Your Honor, for those participating online, you can get our attention here in the council chamber using the raise hand function on your Zoom screen. At the bottom, there are a set of uh, symbols and emojis. If you click on the reactions emoji, you will see the raise hand app or raise hand emoji. And while Pete checks on that, is there anyone in the chambers who wants to address this on an item that is not on the agenda? Yes, sir. If you'd please come forward and identify yourself for the record. Hi, my name is Jason Welder, uh, resident of Clive. Um, just a quick item. We uh, recently applied to build a fence on our easement and um, the uh, amended easement form that we got uh, to sign included a stipulation that we add six foot gates on either end. Um, presumably for easier access for the city to do repairs and whatnot. Um, I understand this is a newer policy um, and I just wanted to voice some concerns with this. Um, it's going to add a large cost, extra cost uh, to our project that we've already put a down payment on. Um, six foot gates are not generally offered so they're gonna to have to be custom made um putting a gate over the easement the land is sloped and so it's going to leave a gap that our pet can get out and so that makes putting the fence in kind of pointless um 
it's at the end of our property and we wanted to put a fence in partially for security reasons. And so having two gates at the end where anybody can just walk through um, also makes putting the fence in kind of pointless. Um, so just wanted to voice our concerns with this new policy. Um, that's all. Thank you. Have you had a chance to discuss with staff? Uh, no, I spoke with somebody when we came to sign the amended uh, easement form, um, but that's all. Hey, Doug, I don't know if you want to. Um, I can just give you a quick bit of back background and uh, maybe Jeff uh, May can uh, also chime in on it. Uh, what we have is a situation where uh, in many parts of the community, we have a varying number of public utility and overland flowage and drainage easements across backyards, generally speaking. Uh, so for the last mm, about 10 years or so, anytime that there's a proposed uh, structure, whether or not it's a fence, a shed, a gazebo, whatever it might be uh, that is proposed to be located within the dedicated easement, we have required the property owner to execute what is called a first amendment to the easement. And basically what that uh, document is doing is declaring that the proposed improvement is agreeable to the city. However, uh, the improvement itself is at risk in the event that the city has a need to access the easement or uh, replace a pipe or other types of uh, activities that would occur within the easement. So it just provides clarity between the property owner and the city in terms of what's gonna happen uh, in the future if there's a need to access the easement. In terms of the uh, more recent uh, change to the policy to provide additional access, I guess I would ask uh, if you're interested in a further conversation, uh, that's a public works matter. Well, maybe I'll suggest at this juncture, uh, Jeff, maybe you've got a moment or, or could uh, collect uh, contact information from Jason and then uh, Take it offline. Yes, be glad to do that. I'll get the information to him. It is a situation we're talking about. I know the requirement for the gap under is if there's a flowage easement, there's water running through the back of there. If the gate or fence goes all the way to the ground, leaves collect on it, it blocks the flowage. So we need to keep the gap so the water doesn't flow up and pond on the neighbors. The gate's uh, something that Doug and I have discussed recently and, and are looking into and following up on a little bit more, but I'll get back with him and we'll follow up some more on that. Appreciate that. And we'll be sure you're honored to follow back up with council on that discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else in the chamber that wants to address the council <clears throat> on an item that is not on the agenda? And we had no one online, Pete, is that oh, correct? Yes. Very good, we'll move on to consent, requires resolution. Move approval, second. Motion is second on our consent items. Further discussion? Seeing none, would the council please vote? And would the clerk please post that vote? And that passes by a vote of five to zero. Next up, we have some presentations, starting with the recognition of service for our retiring fire chief. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Last night, we held uh, a retiring recep reception for retiring fire chief Rick Rowe, who's here with us tonight, along with some of his uh, staff that will also be recognized in some presentations tonight. But we wanted to take an opportunity in front of the mayor and council. We, of course, uh, gave him his gift from the city, which is the golden ax that you see on the table. Uh, I need a couple of people just to handle that thing. Um, but we wanted to take an opportunity here, like we've done with every um, major retirement uh, amongst our staff, to uh, have Rick come before the council, be recognized for his uh, uh, 34 years of service to this community in the last 24 as our fire chief. And so uh, Rick is here tonight and also an opportunity for the council to formally recognize him um, as we had a, uh, a program last night, but we wanna make sure this is his last council meeting. As you'll see later in the agenda, I still have some work for him to do before this council meeting is over, but we wanted to be sure at the beginning of the meeting to, to recognize Rick uh, for his um, many decades of service to the community of Clive. Come on forward, Rick. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't have enough last night. Yeah. <laughs> There's no news cameras in here tonight, though. No news. Um, I guess just kind of a, a quick summary. You know, we had a, shared a lot of words and stuff last night, but uh, 
Matt asked me a question earlier this week, and it's like, what what kept you at Clyde? Why why did you stay here? And uh, there was no hesitation in my voice, and it was it was the people and the way the city of Clive treated me. So great people from the fire department. Um, I've always had great mayors, great council members, great city managers. And um, I always felt like you guys treated me fairly. And so I said, why, why would I leave Clive? And, and, you know, from my heart, that's the way I feel. And um, you guys have been very kind to me and my family and I appreciate it. Thank you, Rick. You've been an exemplary in your service to the city of Clive and we appreciate it. Thank you all. I don't know if other council members want to weigh in. Yeah, I don't know how we topped last <laughs> night and everything that was said, but yeah, we're going to miss you. We're Thank you. Deeply missed. Yeah, you, you really left a legacy here, Rick. I think that's important. And as we look at kind of the branch of people that have gone off and our fire chiefs and, and, and other organizations, that's great. And your leadership role in, in both the metro areas is just uh, uh, one of a kind. So really appreciate everything you've done. Thank you, Rick. For a lot of people in Clive, whether they were at their most vulnerable time or at a community event where the fire department would be out um, just connecting with the community, you were the person they saw as representing Clive. So I'm feeling a little teary about it because not only during my time on the council, but for so many years before that with the Iowa League of Cities and um, other connections to the community I knew what a valuable part you were to this community, have been, and will continue to be. So thank you. Thank you, Susan. You're going to make me cry. <laughs> <laughs> or you almost got Rick maybe again. <laughs> so thank you, Rick. Appreciate it. And you, I've said it to you before, and I agree with everything that's been said, but uh, the, the entire time I've known you, a class act, and the way you've gone out, is even uh, as big of a class act with setting up a secession plan and the crew you have and the new chief you have coming in uh, says a lot about you as a person. And uh, I've always said, you're just a good human and it's been appreciated in Clive. So thanks. Thank you. I did wanna just have one point of privilege as the city attorney. I think we've rewritten your retirement contract today just to ensure that you will continue to be the Santa Claus. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> if the city council will... I certainly have the hair for it. Yep. 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 <laughs> Thank you. You're, you're incredible at all levels. All right. There's not much more we can say. All right. Thank you all. Thanks, Rick. Thanks, Rick. Moving along, we have life-saving presentation. Yeah, and I think Rick's, like I said, we're gonna keep him working. The meeting isn't over yet, so. Yeah, he's, he's not done till tomorrow, so. But yeah, uh, as the mayor knows, uh, council knows, this is one of, one of Rick's, and I mentioned it in my comments last night, one of his passions is this program, and I'm <laughs> honored to have him to be able to give one in his last council meeting. Yeah, this is, this is fun. So I'd like to introduce to you Kristen Nielsen, who's a, a nurse, a uh, traveling nurse, who uh, we were fortunate enough to have working at uh, the Clive Behavioral Health Hospital uh, late in 2022, and uh, did some, uh, um, some, some pretty amazing things. I think the reality is she's probably saved a lot of <laughs> lives um, in, in her time. Uh, probably so much that in the hospital setting, maybe they don't celebrate them as much as we do in the city. But uh, our crews saw what she did. And, uh, and nominate her for the award. The award. And so it's, um, it's gonna be fun to share with you guys uh, what she did. So this happened um, two days after Christmas, December 27th. And RN Kristen Nielsen found a patient lying on a bathroom floor, unresponsive, not breathing, and with considerable emesis in the facial area. Kristen summoned staff to call 911 and continued her care. She rolled the patient on his side used a finger sweep to clear the mouth and administered multiple back blows. This cleared the airway and the patient began to breathe spontaneously and slowly regained consciousness. Kristen provided fast, effective, and ultimately life-saving measures without hesitation. She quickly identified what was an immediate threat to life and acted heroically. The patient was unresponsive for unknown amount of time. However, by clearing his mouth, before stimulating or providing back blows, she provided the best possible chance for regaining a patent airway. So with that, Mayor, I'd like to invite you to present her with the award.
Thank you so much. Thank you. For not only this, but the work you do every day. Thank you. Now there's a photo op. <laughs> Kristen, on the back side of that award, we'll put you in the middle, is the date of the event. So it, uh, oh, nice. as you go on in life, you can share that with family and friends. Well, maybe I should do something like that. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> One, two, three. One, two, three. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Thanks so much. Thank you. Congratulations. I got lucky too. Next, I think we have our new fire chief up. Mayor, Council, uh, thank you. Uh, I'm here to uh, formally introduce you to one of our newly promoted firefighters within the fire department, Jeremy Honest. Jeremy has been with us since, what do we got here, uh, 2018. Yes. Uh, he's been with the Waukee Fire Department, uh, the airport, uh, and uh, with us full time since 2018. Uh, being a newly chief here, one of the fantastic parts of my career is, is getting to, to be a part of the growth and development of a, of a new, new leader within the fire department. So we went through a fantastic assessment center. Jeremy did absolutely great. So he's going to be an incredible addition to the fire department and its future leaders. Uh, he takes it, has a true passion for teaching others, but all in all, just an absolute fantastic leader that I'm happy to, to be a part of this organization with firefighters like Jeremy and new Lieutenant Jeremy Onnes. Congratulations. Thank you. Any so something? The council? No, I told you I wouldn't do it to you. But. I can. Yeah, go for Take it. it. <laughs> Thank you. No like, pressure. Uh, they like, did it to me. So. <laughs> like Chief said, I've been with Clive since 2018. I have uh, about 15 total years in the fire service. Um, I've been honored to serve under Chief Rowe and now look forward to serving under Chief Garcia. Um, I look forward. I love the city of Clive. I don't live in Clive, but I've been passionate about the city ever since I started. Um, we can change that, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I consider it my home, uh, even though I, I, I'll never live in city limits, but that's just me. I love the country. So, um, but yeah, I, I love what I do. I love the people I work with and I'm honored to be in this position. So thank you. Congratulations. Congratulations. We also have the privilege to introduce Isaac Piersma. Um, Isaac comes to us, I uh, grew up in Pella. He's currently a student at DMAC. Um, and interesting with Isaac, he is going to be essentially our, our, our first student. He's actually in firefighter school right now. So Isaac applied to the Clive Fire Department in a, in a part-time status. And when he exited his interview, everybody on the panel said, you've got to hire him full-time. So it was a very unique uh, circumstance because we've historically have never hired anybody that doesn't have their firefighter one and two certifications. But Isaac, uh, stand-up character, uh, did fantastic his interview, and, and we felt that he's going to be a fantastic investment for the Clive Fire Department. So with that, I, I welcome our newest firefighter, Isaac uh, Piersma. So thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. Very excited to work at Clive. Um, it's a department that I've looked up to for a while. Um, I've always wanted to be in the fire service since I was a kid, and, and Clive, I think, is really uh, on the forefront of paving new ways for uh, mental health with just uh, responses and the way in which you guys do training and teamwork and all that sort of stuff. I think you guys are just a fantastic department to work with. Obviously, you have really great city support uh, for the fire department, and so I'm really excited, and I can't wait to get going. Welcome. Hi, Isaac, Welcome. how do you feel about being Santa Claus? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I have to get some gray hair. So. Oh, 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 oh. Get the white beard oh, and everything. Chief Rowe is still around for another day or so, so <laughs> be careful with that. Let's see, right seat coming up tomorrow. Welcome. That concludes our introductions to our new staff. Thank you. Mayor, Council, thank you. We have another introduction, and Jeff. Mayor Council, good evening. It's uh, my pleasure to introduce you to our newest public works operations specialist. Jonah Crilly comes to us from uh, Grimes, uh, currently lives in Waukee. 
uh, has worked in the landscaping industry as a crew leader and comes to us uh, excited to be here and almost as excited as we are to have him here. So I'll introduce you to Jonah Crelly. Jonah, I say a word? Hi there, I'm Jonah. Uh, I'm really looking forward to serving the city of Clive. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Welcome. 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 Thanks, Chef. Thank you. <clears throat> Next, we'll move into our action items. First, we have is a public hearing. Uh, did we publish the appropriate public notice? Yes, Your Honor. It was published in the Des Moines Register on May 15th, 2023. Thank you. Amanda. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, so tonight we have on the agenda a public hearing for rezoning consideration. Um, that we are kind of referring to as the Northwest 156th Street and Emerald Isle Drive rezoning. It would be the remaining five single family lots that were not rezoned with the come and go process back in 2016 um, that I believe most of you were on the council for at that time. Um, so if you may recall, there were those five homes that at that time were not ready to sell. Um, so they remained R1 while the rest of that block was acquired um, and rezoned to C4. Um, and so Midwest Fidelity Partners has assembled those remaining properties and submitted a rezoning request from R1 to C4. Um, there is a question out there with some of the needed public improvements on timing of when those would be installed, uh, not really related to the obligation of public improvements being required, um, but just when would be appropriate to have those installed. Mm -hmm. Um, however, it has come to our attention late this afternoon that mayor and um, city attorney may have some comments they'd like to bring to uh, everyone's attention on this one. Go for it. No, please. <laughs> Me first. Your mic's not on. All right. Thank you, uh, Amanda. Um, my understanding is through information that's developed throughout the day today, we understand there's really two issues for the council to consider tonight. Uh, one, we believe one council member may have a conflict of interest and in the vote, as you know, the, the ordinance, uh, city ordinance and state law requires a four fifths vote because of the pending protest to this rezoning. And we just wanna make sure that we conduct our due diligence on that pending conflict of interest question. Specifically, uh, council member Michelinini, um, he may have a pecuniary financial interest in the vote tonight and we're not, we don't have all of the information to make that determination tonight. And so the council is presented with an option to move forward with the vote or to table vote so that we can get to the bottom of whether or not um, the, the developer, my understanding is Midwest Fidelity um, relationship there, them or their subsidiary may have a financial relationship with Mr. M uh, council member Michelinini's company. And we don't have all the details from that yet. As I said, it raised that conflict raised this afternoon. So without finality on that decision, my recommendation specifically with respect to the conflict is that eliminates one council member from the vote tonight of, of the four fifths requirement. The second issue that raised today um, was a question of whether or not based on staff's recommendation and concerns about infrastructure, whether or not the council could do a conditional rezoning, meaning could you vote to rezone on the condition that certain infrastructure um, improvements are made on certain timelines, or could you condition rezoning on other requirements more than just um, compliance with the comprehensive plan? And the answer is found under Iowa Code 414.5, which covers conditional zoning. And the answer is yes, the city council can require if you desire, after listening to public comment tonight uh, and the input, the city council can condition rezoning from R1 to C4, right yep. here, um, on these additional requirements beyond just the statutory requirement of comprehensive plan, et cetera, including consideration of the fit in the neighborhood and other public need. Again, the reference for that is Iowa Code 414.5. So what I'm saying is one, we have a conflict of interest issue to work out. And so perhaps vote, maybe tonight's vote um, is premature. Second, um, because you may wanna consider a conditional approval of the rezoning, 
if you do want to impose those conditions that staff is concerned about with respect to the infrastructure or other improvements with the property to fit the neighborhood, you um, can ask for those conditions, but it's on consent. It's on written consent of the property owner who's asked for that um, rezoning. And that, that agreement between the city and the property owner needs to be entered into and considered as part of the rezoning public hearing so that all of the public can review what's being presented as consideration for the public need. So what does that mean for us? Well, what that means is, again, maybe a vote is premature because you want to look at imposing certain conditions or negotiating with the property owner about some of the issues that the public has raised for whatever, you know, would fit within the statute or, or the, con the concerns, particularly that staff has raised with respect to infrastructure. Public need and reasonable restriction are your two limitations for looking at those conditions. So with that in mind, I just wanted to kind of set that out for council that um, your options tonight are definitely to have the public hearing, take as much input and dialogue and discussion as you would like. Um, council member Michelinini is permitted certainly to participate in the dialogue and the discussion. I would just caution that perhaps we shouldn't go to a vote. And if he does, I would recommend abstaining at this time. So the council can certainly have public hearing. And then perhaps if you'd like to look at that conditional, right, the second issue here, if you'd like to look at those conditions for rezoning, um, it might be prudent to continue the public hearing, keep it open. Because any of those conditions that re you reach agreement with, with the property owner needs to be entered into before you adjourn your hearing on the public hearing. So that anyone who has an interest in, in what's being raised in that agreement can come back to the council and have that discussion. So with that, Your Honor, those are the two legal issues presented. Are there questions on, uh, I guess, where that took us or where we're at? Okay, just to uh, summarize where we are at this point, the recommendation, if uh, the council has its questions addressed, is to continue the public hearing so we can take care of those additional matters. Correct, Your Honor. To maybe the June 22nd. Uh, I think practically speaking, a two-week continuance might be too short. Okay. And so I think the second meeting in June would be most prudent so that all of the parties can have a chance to review any agreements or dialogue or negotiation, and then the public can have comment. And then the same I know thing that delays things, but it keeps things on track. And then as far as the ordinance that's underneath that, then that would be tabled also to that meeting. Again, that's if correct, that's Your the Honor. will of the council. If that's the will of the council, a continuance of the hearing, and then on the ordinance, a tabling of the ordinance, that would also address the first issue, so we would have time to look at the, con the conflict issue. Yes, Your Honor. All right. Well, let's get uh, input from the council on these matters first. Maybe we'll start at this end. Uh, Michael? The infrastructure question is interesting to me, right? And has been one of my concerns, and I guess it's regardless of what property or you know, what we're going to build there, whoever's going to build there, um, is the infrastructure capacity there to support, you know, uh, even this requested commercial use, right? Um, that's, I guess, my first. Okay, man. Um, um, I think before I speak anymore that the applicant might have wanted to address the continuation conversation. Oh. Um, do you still want to well, no, I'll have any comments? That if there, pardon me. Sorry, okay. no, I don't want to step on any toes. Uh, Joel Templeman, uh, an attorney with the Livel Somali Law Firm, 505 Fifth Avenue, Suite 1005, Des Moines. I'm here on behalf of the applicant, Midwest Fidelity Partners. And no, I, when uh, we spoke briefly about this potential issue before the meeting started, but if by all means, please have your discussion first. When you're finished, I'm happy to provide you with, I guess, our preference if you'd like to hear that, but then I don't want to get in the way right now. All right, thank you, Joe. Thanks. Go ahead. Can... Right, well, that would be my first question and then it would lead into some additional questions, you know, uh, when would those improvements be made, right? Um, specifically to that Hickman interchange, you know, uh, when it comes to capacity and I would say a little bit dicey interchange up there. Certainly. Um, with, with respect to Emerald Isle Drive, which is adjacent to this property to the north, it is an 
unimproved rural roadway section. It was brought into the city through annexation. Uh, the city has done um, a, a few minor adjustments from the gravel road to a seal coat to throwing some asphalt just to kind of keep um, accessibility available for the existing residential properties. Uh, over the last, uh, again, five or six years, there's been an interest in redeveloping the Emerald Isle area, generally speaking. Um, again, this is being converted mostly from single family residential to some type of higher intensity use, whether or not it's commercial or higher intensity residential, townhome, multifamily to the north. Uh, we know um, as a staff that the intensification, again, regardless of the use type, the intensification of this property is going to require capacity improvements uh, within Emerald Isle Drive itself. Um, so yes, uh, it, at, at some point as this property transitions from its current single family or vacant use uh, to a more intense use, investments will need to be made. So get my one follow up and I'll go down the road here, but in a case like this, who would be responsible for those costs or those improvements, right? I would, I'm imagining full road, right? On Emerald Isle, um, both sides of the road, the stormwater, right? on and on about the infrastructure, right? Who's, whose cost is that to bear and at what time? Sure. Um, the roadway itself uh, would be improved to an urban street section. Uh, in this particular case, for a commercialized uh, street, it would be 31 feet wide, concrete pavement. A standard curb and gutter, sidewalks on both sides, street lights, et cetera. So, you know, a, a street section that is the same as everywhere else in the city. Uh, so that capacity would need to be uh, put into place. Additionally, there would be some uh, considerations for intersection related improvements, kind of as you were alluding to with Hickman Road, uh, to be able to accommodate those turning movements onto the state highway. Uh, so all of those improvements uh, would need to be made in, in Emerald Isle. Uh, in terms of the cost associated with those improvements, uh, the city's policy has been that the uh, adjoining developments as they occur, assume the responsibility for half of those roadway improvements. So in this case, we're talking about 15 and a half feet of a 31 foot wide street their associated uh, costs associated for the sidewalks, the street lights, so forth. Um, so in this circumstance, uh, any, again, development that would occur on this property would have that obligation. But we certainly can't build a half a road, right? We've never done that before. Correct. We don't have other development, sorry. Well, we don't have other development on that north side. Where are we going with that? Yes, um, so you're correct. We do have a situation in which um, the south side of the road, generally speaking, is what's in front of you tonight for that intensification to commercial use. So their obligation is for half of that roadway improvement. Again, as you alluded to, uh, building half of a road is not something that's either practical or useful for any of the parties. So um, the situation then is that either the roadway improvements are deferred until some point in the future in which say the city is the, the lead agency for building the roadway. Uh, alternatively, um, which is the case in most of our developments, the impacted developer is involved with the construction of the roadway improvement in conjunction with the site development improvements. And uh, typically, that's how the roadways themselves ultimately get built. Yep. No. My question is whether <clears throat> timing of a delay causes any problems for either of the parties. Are they wanting to see this move forward now, or is it just as <clears throat> well to, to wait? I'd be interested in what that impact is. You know, I understand the concern about the potential conflict of interest, but whether we had 
somebody have to recuse themselves now or down the road, we're still going to have the numbers issue. So I don't know if that would be the primary reason to do it, but um, it probably would be good to have all the information in front of us, but if delaying harms one of the parties, I'd like to know it. I guess we'll go ahead and we'll loop back to that so that yeah. they can answer all the questions at once. Eric. Yeah, my question deals with traffic on this. Uh, we've done a traffic study and what I look at is impact to not only neighboring businesses, but, but uh, uh, also, you know, rooftops and residential areas as well. What staff's thoughts on capacity and uh, traffic? And is this is the proposed business is a consumer generated business right there. So what's your what's your thoughts on capacity and traffic? Yeah, so the Hickman corridor studies have considered that area with the future land use plans in mind. So it was considered with commercial development for that portion um, that came into play with the recommendations on turn lane signalization all throughout the corridor. Um, so that staff didn't see a need to do an additional traffic study because we already have recent data on that. Um, and we've already investigated that with past projects and rezoning on this section. Um, it's also consistent with the city's future land use plan that this would be commercial. Um, so we've already kind of generally identified that that area would meet our kind of capacity requirements um, once improved to that condition. Um, sorry, you had a second question. I think I'm skipping over. <laughs> Is staff comfortable with capacity then? Um, so what staff, what staff had initially discussed when we sat down was um, a portion of the roadway being installed that would support a driveway access to the site and then deferring construction on the remainder um, for the city to handle some of the more complex problems. Um, that was kind of the general consensus between community development and public works, I believe, when we got together um, to see how we might move forward with a project out here, since those improvements aren't part of the CIP. Of course, there are concerns that have come up from the public um, about whether or not that's an appropriate course of action. So I would let Doug speak further. Well, I think really there's, there's two questions there. One is overall with respect to capacity, roadway capacity, turning movement capacity. The primary issue, again, regardless of what ultimately develops on this property, uh, we know from staff's perspective that uh, infrastructure investments need to be made to address the intensification of the property. Uh, we believe that uh, improving it to our traditional commercial roadway section, 31 feet, uh, with turning movement accommodations at the intersection with Hickman will provide the appropriate amount of capacity to support whatever type of development occurs on this property, as well as what would have ultimately be developed on the north side of Emerald Isle Drive. So in terms of the overall capacity, I think we have a handle on what is necessary. The primary issue is associated with the timing of those improvements. Uh, so there is certainly some concerns that have been brought up that uh, needing to get those improvements made in conjunction or as early as possible to support these intensified uses of the property. Thank you. Ted. So we have some townhomes that are going to be going in that's fairly nearby. Um, and so my part of my concern is, is the impact to those potential homeowners. Um, so my question is one, uh, and this is irrespective of what would go in the, this particular applicant, just in general, um, as part of the rezoning process, can we put in certain limitations uh, to help uh, protect those homeowners? Um, for example, in the past, we've had limitations around dog kennels, auto repair shops, things that might, might uh, cause some noise pollution. Um, is that something that can be done as part of this process? Yes, yeah, so you could add um, some of those kinds of restrictions. Um, that was what Christina was talking about earlier with those agreements for conditions on the rezoning being agreed to. Um, typically what we've seen, and um, you see it in the 2016 come and go uh, rezoning is that it, it did restrict the animal boarding and kennels and the auto repair. That was an applicant driven restriction. 
um, because they wanted more control over who their neighbors would be as the business. Um, so that is frequently, uh, if it's a non-PUD designation um, in our modern times, those typically come from the applicant for those kinds of land use restrictions. Um, they certainly can come from the city um, and be agreed to as so part that of that could be part of this process agreement. as we put some yes. of those limitations in as part of the rezoning, in addition yes. to some of the conditions that Christina was talking about. Yes, and I believe from what Christina said that then we would have to have that all completed prior to the closing of the public hearing. Right, right. Okay. Anything else, Ted? That's good. Srikant, do you have any questions tonight? Yeah, uh, <clears throat> I've got a quick question. Um, more of a curiosity, I guess. I'm, I'm wondering if uh, we could learn a little bit more about the, the thought process behind why the, the, the property, I'm looking at the, uh, the concept plan sheet uh, why the car wash was selected for the middle property and, and not for the future development, because I'm, I'm seeing more entrance and exit possibilities since there is an adjacent roadway there, rather than having to have traffic come to the car wash by cutting through that future development area. Um, I'm, I'm curious if we could learn a little bit more about the, the thought process there. Um, are you want, I guess, just for clarification, are we wanting to address that tonight before we hear if they want to continue the hearing or not to a later date? I just don't want to procedurally misstep on this one. <laughs> no, that's a good point. Yeah, I guess if we're gonna if we're gonna wait on that, yeah, we can we can wait on my question as well. Okay. I would encourage fulsome discussion this evening. There you have it. I, like I think we'll need to hear from the developer to answer Susan's question and then Srikant as well. I guess first I'd like to just address the, the issue regarding this potential conflict and the idea of the continuation. And given the unknown status of where um, legal counsel will, will land on the, the conflict issue, um, we would like to request that this item be continued to another meeting. I mean, we're already up against the supermajority requirement for council approval to move forward. And if we remove, you know, if we're at the position right now where we're uncertain of a conflict, and then so if that member recuses themselves from this meeting, we're down to four voting members. If they don't recuse themselves and they vote, then there's an appeal issue that we don't want to get involved in. Uh, we'd prefer to take the time, vet the issue, let legal counsel advise you folks as to whether or not there is a conflict. Um, we could also address the other conditional items that were raised and maybe have a more fruitful discussion in June when we have our arms around everything. Um, we're not, trust me, we're not in trying to delay presenting to you tonight, but what I don't want to have happen is to have staff continue with their description of our project, have me come up and explain our position and then have to stop it due to this conflict or, and then open it back up. I, I think it just, that disjointed process probably isn't effective. Um, and I'd rather just take it up at one time in June. So that would be my request to council. Um, I'll let uh, Ben speak if, if he wants to address that issue on behalf of the bank. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Joe. Good evening, Council. Ben Bruner, Dickinson Law Firm, 699 Walnut Street in Des Moines. Um, here on behalf of Iowa Trust and Savings Bank as a neighboring property owner, we certainly don't object to the proposal to table this or continue it to a later date. Again, I think it makes sense to get everybody up to date on what the information is as the conflict, potential conditions, and then come back again and have a more fruitful conversation at that point. So we consent to that or don't object. Thank you. Your Honor, I think what I'm hearing, so go ahead. Go ahead. No, I think what I'm hearing is procedurally um, the recommendation, and I guess the, the, the harm to both the applicant and, and protester is, is satisfied. Y'all are okay if we move forward with discussion, but, but uh, continue hearing until later in uh, uh, June, or are you, Joel, are you asking us I just think not having, I just think discussion. we just I think we don't have any further conversation about it whatsoever tonight. I think we just take it all up in June and have one 
my concern with that, if I may, sure. on behalf of the city and, and staff is they've raised some concerns and there are a few other questions I think that would narrow the issues for whatever conditional zoning that might be in their heads. Okay. So if we can address a few of those questions, um, at least maybe we can narrow the issues for whatever agreement, because the way I read 414 is we got to bring an agreement forward before any of the hearing is completed, right? Okay, so I don't disagree with that. I guess my concern, Marcus, I just want to be clear that we're not taking any action tonight on, on our rezoning request. And since we're here tonight, the action item tonight is before the council is strictly rezoning. We're not talking about site plan issues that will come back at a separate time. And so I just don't want it to get into a muddied argument or discussion about you know, specific site layout and site plan issues when we are here on a land use rezoning issue. Um, and so I guess with that qualification, I guess I'm okay with that. I mean, but it's ultimately your decision as to how you see fit to go Yeah, forward. I appreciate that. I, I just wanted to just clarify, I think the statute does allow the council to consider um, conditions based on public need or requested public need as long as they're reasonable mm -hmm. and if if as long as you can hear what the request is maybe then you can over the month come back to us and say that's crazy christina mm -hmm. you know we can't do that it's sure. unreasonable so we're if open there to hearing some, that. Full, some dialogue at least on a few of these questions i think that narrows our issues mm -hmm. yes but i i respect your reservation on the site plan question uh that's fine so long as we're not once again, I'm being redundant, just so long as we're not taking any action tonight with a potential conflict of interest from the council. There will be no vote this evening is what I understand, but the council has not made that ask yet. They've not made that motion yet. Okay. Right. I mean, he, he could preclude himself, right? And, and everything would be fine. It, it would just be, it, that would take care of any argument if he abstained tonight. There's no argument on either side. So I'm saying, I, I'm not sure... I'm comfortable with the stipulations by you on something like that, where where the councilman could uh, abstain tonight, and I don't think any of the arguments would be later, um, you know, relevant uh, to this. So we could vote uh, if an abstention. I, I, for one, would like to discuss some of these things because, no disrespect, but you know, half a dozen emails and phone calls, and the lobbying work continues. Uh, for another month, if we could get some of these questions answered, perhaps that saves both sides, sure. the emails, the phone calls, the, you know, where we could then narrow um, the discussions between city staff and, uh, and of course, if the council wants to vote tonight, I think it's the council's decision. Um, but. So what questions further? Well, uh, you know, I guess, when it comes to that, I, I am concerned, and I've said it on multiple projects, is is budgets, right, for the city. And so um, we have an example of a like situation just to the west where oh, the bank happens to be here. So, you know, I guess those answers can come from staff or others, but this has to be exact situation of the bank with Emerald Isle, correct? And some improvements and things to those roads or to any other improvements that have been put in by the bank. And then, you know, who paid for those? Uh, did the city or was it in our CIP or? Sure. So um, when we worked with, at that time, come and go uh, with their proposal to develop the corner and the associated rezoning for all of the project. The issue and question of this roadway infrastructure was the same uh, at that particular time. Uh, as we worked through that process with come and go, the circumstances from the city were, again, generally similar. Uh, you have a proposal, the city does not have the roadway or the other infrastructure in its capital improvement plan. We do not have those improvements budgeted for right at the moment. Um, so in the case of the come and go development, their uh, response to that was, we will take the obligation of designing, constructing, uh, the roadway improvements as part of their site plan improvements. Obviously, the come and go property didn't uh, materialize completely. It was sold off um, as the bank put together their site plan. Similar circumstance, 
where it made the most sense. It was the most efficient to have that roadway improvement a part of the site development. In that particular case, we, we did have the benefit of, you know, now a six or seven year gap. So we had uh, started to accumulate the necessary funds to facilitate the north half of that 300 foot section of Emerald Isle Drive. So the bank has designed it, they're in the process of, process of constructing it, and then they will be reimbursed by the city for the north half. And then the north half, uh, as it's developed, will address its obligation. So I guess just to clear up my concern on that, I would imagine that the, the developer of this would have the same philosophy, right? And that wouldn't be an issue. I mean, it would overcome that one issue of at least the, bu the budgetary piece of the city where it's significant dollars. And look, with all the cuts and everything that have been happening on the municipal side, right? Um, that's real, that's real money. I don't know what the dollar amount would be, but you got to be million, whatever it is on a road like that. Yeah, we're talking about um, approximately a thousand feet of road that need to be constructed, both the east-west segment of Emerald Isle and then the north-south down to Hickman Road, approximately a thousand feet. Again, just to kind of give you an order of magnitude, because we've not got into any kind of design process, uh, either from the applicant or from a city-initiated project. But you're looking at about a million dollars of improvement. Um, and then obviously, if you look at it from the standpoint of where those obligations are. In this case, uh, the proposed applicant is gonna have half of that uh, uh, obligation for the roadway improvements. And again, uh, I just wanna use that as a kind of order of magnitude. We have not done any kind of design. We have not uh, gotten into specifics, but that'll give you a kind of a perception of what's necessary. Uh, this particular segment, similar to the one in the past, we do not have it in our capital improvement plan at the moment. Um, so that is a concern that, um, you know, if that roadway improvement needs to, to happen, um, you know, coming up with, if you will, the city's half that we will then have to uh, address when the development on the north side of the road comes into place uh, is a concern that we would have to address in the very near term. Yeah, I share Mike's concerns on the budget, and I mean, they're they're going to get the full benefit of that roadway because we're not going to have that that development on the north side here, at least in the near future. So, um, yeah, I'm 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 with Mike on on the concerns on the budget side of things. So let me just clarify: you're you're suggesting the road should go in? Is that? Well, if it has to go in, but it, we have to put in the whole road, right? right. And no, I think have, these yeah. are some of the things that can be discussed in this month or two month, whatever it is, continuation of this uh, to get it negotiated. Um, these are the things that need to be talked about. I think that's the value of having this full discussion tonight by both sides, the residents and us, is so that this negotiation can happen. So you're not coming back with a, some a deal that staff made and now council is sideways and telling you to go back again because these conditional pieces aren't here. And so I, I, that's all I caution you about is asking for no discussion tonight could delay this even further uh, with some more discussions after we see a deal that isn't put together in, in that way. Well, it seems to me the road's a, a big, big piece of it. So I wanna make sure I was clear on what you were saying and if there was any consensus on the council. And Ted, were you? Yeah, I have a uh, question now. Susan? Is it in an urban renewal area? Yes. Well, we've been expecting development to happen. And I think yes. as the chair of our economic vitality committee, I would at least like to say we need to be forward looking at thinking through how we plan to support development we're expecting and needing. So I agree that it's good to have a discussion, but I do like hearing that the city is committed to wanting to see development happening in those areas where we have an urban renewal area for a reason. And that allows for some improvements to be financed through tax increment financing. So 
it isn't that we just have to wait for funding to accrue. Anything from you, Eric? No, I've said my piece. I, I share the concerns uh, raised here on, on the cost of this road as well, though. So I uh, uh, certainly share that as well. Shrika, further inf uh, questions from you? Um, you know, I, I, I think I'm going to rephrase my previous question. I know it came, I think, I think it came off as a, as a site plan question, but I think it does have direct impact to the infrastructure piece that Councilmember McCoy was just talking to. You know, we're we're talking about if if the if the car wash moves further to the east, there would I'm not a I'm not a developer to be clear, but it seems to me common sense that that would require less concrete to be poured, less of the roadway to be fully developed at one particular time. So I'm I'm curious if there's been thought given to that. I guess is the way I'll rephrase my previous question. So is that something the developer would be able to answer as far as the site? I know that we're not talking about the site plan at all tonight, but maybe it'd be helpful to have at least some insights on that. Uh, hey, good evening. Josh Johnson with Houston Engineering, um, uh, Sioux Falls. I can give you details later if you'd like all that. Um, but working with MFP, our developer and crew, um, our reasoning for putting the car wash in the center lot is that uh, and we talked about a planning and zoning commission. Amanda had some good examples, but in all reality, the sales of real estate on corner parcels goes faster and it's more wanted. So by us putting our car wash in the center, we felt that the more valuable piece of property for future development is on the outside that's more accessible. So we were taking the hit on the land cost for our piece in terms of the bigger picture re uh, redevelopment. So that was our reasoning to initially start with our car wash on the interior piece. And I should let Amanda expand on it, but she made some examples at Planning and Zoning Commission where lots that were developed on the outside first that are generally speaking in the same region or same area of town have taken much longer to sell and redevelop. But if you'd like to ask her that question, she could probably explain it a lot better. That was our basis for how we started this. So, so you'd be open to moving it? We're open to considerations, absolutely. And we've got lots of things going on, so there's some options, but uh, that was generally speaking how we started where we did Thanks. Srikant, does that you. answer? Okay. Yeah, yep, that helps. Thank you. Good. Further questions? Uh, I might ask uh, Council Member Weaver, I know you alluded to or had requested consideration of the townhouse and residential impact. Would you care to elaborate a little bit more on what you might see um, or want to see in this really in this condition so that we can address those public needs or concerns? Yeah, I mean, I, obviously we, we do a lot of development or that buffer next to residential um, areas. And I just wanna make sure we're considering that um, as part of the rezoning so that whether it's lighting, whether it's noise, whether it's traffic, whatever those, those, those items are, that we're making sure we're we're taking those into account so that we're we're protecting that residential area and those homeowners. Thank you. Further discussion items. Again, what legal counsel has recommended is that we continue this uh, public hearing until June 22nd. We can do that by motion, yes, thank Move you. Move to continue the public hearing on this matter till uh, June 22nd, 2023. Second. We have a motion and a second to continue the public hearing. Is there further discussion or anyone else in the council to address us on this particular aspect? Seeing none, would the council please vote? And then would the clerk please post that vote? And the motion to continue passes by a vote of five to zero. Next, we have up uh, the proposed ordinance and the recommendation here is to table that also to the June 22nd meeting. My motion, motion. is well. Yes, thank you. Move that motion and table that until the June 22nd, 2023 meeting. Second. Motion and second to table. Further discussion? Seeing none, would the council please vote? And will the clerk please Post that 
And that passes by vote of five to zero. We'll take these matters up on June twenty second, and in the intervening month, uh, the parties will work. Yes, Matt. And your honor, just to just to close out this item, legal counsel has their uh, direction in terms of reviewing the potential conflict with Councilmember McMillaney, and then based on council's comments tonight, staff has their direction in terms of further dialogue with the property owner and developer on particularly obviously the the passion that the council has talked about related to the roadway we'll have those discussions with them and then likely hopefully come back with with a product for you all on june 22nd for your consideration and to kind of then to really start to complete the conversation that you all started tonight and again just to underscore what legal counsel said the agreement has to be made before we close the public hearing correct that's correct thank you your honor very good I think that concludes that item. We'll move on to the next public hearing on Shadow Creek. Did we publish the appropriate public notice? Public notice was published in the Des Moines Register on May 10th, 2023. Thank you. Amanda, please continue. Good evening again. Um, so tonight we have before you a rezoning consideration um, that was submitted by Dreamscape Home Builders on behalf of Shadow Creek Heights, LLC. <clears throat> um, to orient you, we have Meredith up here. Okay, uh, Meredith is up here, Westgate Parkway um, extension through this area. And then this general area is our Shadow Creek North development that's been going in over the last couple of years. Um, so the full property today is this whole piece here. And that is about 28 acres. Um, but the applicant is proposing just to rezone the hashed area that's approximately 12.8 acres um, to be rezoned to PUD and that the remaining south portion of the property would remain R1 as it is today. Uh, the PUD rezoning would support a mixed association residential development with um, the townhome or the sorry the single family product to the south. That mixed uh, residential association um, could include attached townhomes or detached townhomes. Um, so it's similar to like our R4 zoning designation would be, um, but to address some of the layout concerns um, and stormwater management kind of issues, uh, staff has worked with the applicant to prepare a zoning change and development agreement that lays out um, some specific items. So what you're going to find in that that differs from our basic R4 zoning um, would be uh, a streetscape option along Alpine Drive here, rather than having that full 30-foot um, landscape buffer that we would typically find between townhome and single family. Um, that is very similar to what was approved and constructed along Wilden Drive as part of that PUD. Um, and then this is the same developer proposing to do um, the entirety of the property. Um, so that allows for that enhanced streetscape rather than an actual buffer um, to continue to provide that connectivity and access um, from the townhomes down to the Greenbelt Trail and Park area um, is the main intent there. And then also kind of have that mix of residential options that is in one area and more like a neighborhood rather than being um, truncated and separated from itself. Um, so the future land use map does show this area as, <clears throat> excuse me, as residential low density, um, which attached and detached townhomes are a single family home product. They are individually owned and occupied and sellable um, as a property. Uh, so those do meet the, the typical single family definitions um, that are kind of industry standards for planning. Um, and so today we're really talking about the appropriate of the land use, not necessarily the development concept. Um, so staff has worked with the applicant um, for a couple years trying to find a layout and development that addresses all of the concerns and challenges. Matthew, I don't know, are you able to zoom out slightly? Okay. <laughs> um, that addresses all the concerns and challenges. Um, and this went forward to Plan and Zoning Commission a couple months ago um, with a first uh, consideration that the applicant ended up withdrawing before it came to council. So we would have time to work through some of the concerns that plan and zoning had raised 
um, around stormwater management design, site layout, landscaping, um, recreation space, those kinds of typical um, items they'd raise concerns on. Uh, so how staff, the change that you see um, from what PNZ originally considered isn't really on the, the conceptual layout because this is just a demonstration of the land use that's proposed and the ability to extend um, street and infrastructure networks. So with the changes really are in that zoning change and development agreement text um, from what PNZ looked at at their first time they reviewed this and then at their meeting just last month with this being the second application for the same rezoning. Um, so that, that document lays out those specific planting requirements. Um, it details setbacks that are all basically just the typical R4 um, requirements for everything except that streetscape. And then it does give some specific references to stormwater design. Um, the intent by the applicant would be that ultimately um, this stormwater lot and facility would be dedicated to the city as parkland dedication um, and integrated into the Greenbelt Trail and park. Um, so there are some specific design standards in there about what that stormwater facility would need to be designed to um, for the city to consider acceptance of that property. Um, uh, so we also then have some uh, requirements associated with the aesthetics of those properties, um, bringing in the hardy siding requirement um, that we frequently have in our zoning change and development agreements. Um, we would also include that with a minimum 20% masonry on the total facade for the townhome and association residential portion. Um, but then additionally, any facade that was oriented toward a public street, which would be Alpine or Westgate, would also have to have that enhanced architecture, that 20% masonry. Um, and then our typical language about requiring perimeter trim for windows and doors and other architectural detailing. Um, so the, the final approval of those design specifics would be with the site plan for the townhome portion. Um, so what the applicant is really requesting with this tonight of not significantly revising the conceptual layout is that they get approval for that land use with those restrictions in the zoning change and development agreement. Again, except those few items outlined in the staff report, it is the same as the R4 zoning district. So it would be um, a typical town home development. Um, so with that, then they would feel comfortable investing the cost to redesign the layout or make other changes that they might need to meet the full requirements once they ensured that the land use was acceptable to council in the community. Um, and so with that, staff has had a little bit of public input. Um, we had quite a bit of communication on the first application with some of the neighboring property owners. Um, they did not all attend the plan and zoning meeting. There's just a couple that we've been in contact with, um, but a, a Lisa, I think it's Rubsom, if I'm saying her name correctly, um, who is a, a resident on the north side of Meredith, um, did submit comment that was in your packet that they have some concerns with property value impacts um, from a attached or detached townhome type of product. Um, we know from our local housing study reports um, that in Clive, we haven't seen that negative impact for single family next to townhome, first comparable single family, not next to townhomes. Um, so staff doesn't feel that there is going to be um, a negative impact to property values um, for the property owners across Meredith or um, on either side of the property here. Um, so with that, um, I would open it up uh, for the applicant if they have any comments to make, and then of course, um, questions from the council, and uh, then public comment. Very good, questions from the council. Eric. And uh, PNZ, uh, according to the notes here, did raise some concerns about the viability of the development and once adjustments for stormwater recreation acquired landscaping have been made. Yes. Could you address that? Uh, yes, yeah, so that was those concerns I was referencing that this layout just doesn't really satisfy the requirements. Um, the stormwater management plan isn't meeting the full standards, um, but that's where this is really the, the reset point to say, okay, Clive's typical process is we get really into the details on these rezoning requests. Um, that kind of streamlines a little bit down the road when they come in with their site plan and preliminary plot submittal. Um, however, in this case, the applicant has requested the more um, traditional approach of a discrete approval 
um, a rezoning approval, a preliminary plat approval, construction drawing approval, site plan approval, um, more in that order. So they're individual chunks so they can manage the um, investment and time and money that's needed to prepare those documents to ensure that they have those approvals. Mm -hmm. So those questions have not been fully addressed, but the expectations and requirements for those have been included in the zoning change and development agreement. Is the development agreement consistent with the city's comprehensive plan? Um, in my opinion, staff's opinion, yes, it would be consistent with the comprehensive plan. Um, I would consider a townhome development to fall in that low density residential. Thank you. Any questions on this? One question on the low density versus, I get what you're saying, but if I read somewhere talked about changing to a medium density, um, this would not be a medium, it would still be a low density? Um, it, so density is kind of a difficult concept because you can have a lot of different um, layouts and configurations that would have the same numeric number of density. Um, so this is uh, approximately six or seven units per acre would be the density for the townhome portion up here. Um, planning generally would not consider that to be a medium or high density development. Um, our comprehensive plan, I think, refers to um, kind of that four to eight acre being low density um, and then kind of a, it's, a, it's in a bit of a gray area. Um, but I would say that in staff's opinion, that use would be consistent um, given that Meredith is a primary road uh, and provides some additional buffering from some of the other residential uses. Any other questions from council? Again, what we have here is a need to close the public hearing. Sarah, you to close public hearing. Is there a second? Second. I'll just second make close this, public hearing. I'll make a statement for the record that just to be consistent like we were in the last matter for public hearing, what? the zoning agreement uh, development, zoning change agreement is actually completed and before the council for consideration. Just so you know, we are applying our principles uh, consistently here. Thanks for that clarification. Any further discussion where anyone, go ahead. Need, uh, some comments from the developer. I just, I just, hello everybody. Good, good evening. I'm Ume Mexi. I'm one of the owners of Dreamscape Home Builders, and we're really excited to bring this community to the beautiful addition of Clive and to the community uh, with the, the awesome high school there and Shadow Creek. I'm also a, a real estate agent, real estate broker. I get a chance to work with this handsome man over here to the left as he's our broker for um, our West Des Moines office. But I just want to make sure that we have been really um, impressed and working really hard with Amanda and Doug and got a chance to meet with Matt a few weeks back. And we are flexible. We are open-minded. We're here to make this a win-win for the whole entire community. We know that we're going to bring a lot of um, awesome homes. And also with that, it's going to bring some great property tax revenue. And as far as the stormwater and the, the green space, we are flexible to, to reduce some units as needed. We feel that uh, the green space and the stormwater is pretty adequate right now. We feel the landscape and the buffer is also going to be something that is going to make the, the city overall very, very proud. Uh, we have, we um, are working with some investors on this. And as you can imagine, they've been sitting on this land for a couple of years now and paying four, five, six, seven, eight percent interest. So they have been um, eating some absorbent um, interest costs. So time is of the essence because ultimately, not only will they be at a loss as far as, you know, profits, they could you know, also be in, in the red, but also this unfortunately will put that cost over to the end user, which that's always not so fun either. So if anything, if I may, I encourage you all to consider uh, what we're planning on doing with the uh, smaller townhome units versus the bigger single family lots. It's also bringing uh, a product to the area where, you know, it's an affordable suburban product, which isn't always available. Um, and City of Clive is kind of known, unfortunately, for having more higher priced homes and that six, you know, the neighboring development, um, friends with the developer, those homes on average are in the seven, eight, nine, they're, 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 they're hitting over a million dollars. And unfortunately, there's a lot of people that would love to live in that neighborhood and go to those schools surrounding that area, but they can't afford it. So we are bringing smaller, uh, new, affordable, luxurious homes to individuals and their children to be able to be a part of your beautiful community and they're willing to pay Clive taxes. So I think it's a win, win, win. And also, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we are bringing about $4 million of local development money that's gonna stay local with workers, 
um, equipment and uh, material. And so all, all, all the way, this is, a, uh, this is what we would call a win, 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 win. Thank, thank you. Further discussion, anyone else in the chamber? Oh, well, Mr. Mayor, I was just going to say, I, I will be abstaining from, from the votes here uh, just due to my relationship with uh, the, one of the owners. Very good. Further discussion in the public hearing? Seeing none, would the council please vote on closing the public hearing? And will the clerk please post that vote? Um, Your Honor, that passed uh, four with one abstention. That is frozen up, and I can't get it off of the screen right now. So, but thank you. We may be for at the rest of the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for announcing the vote. Oh, there, no, there, four there. in favor. That's good. Uh, next, we have the first reading. Yes. Move, move the proposed ordinance uh, one one three six have been considered by the council to vote on passage prior to its final adoption. One, one, Second. Three, wait, wait. We, that wait. was one one, one, one one three, three six. Well, oops, I'm sorry. Oh. Uh, one one three five. Uh, 1135, sorry, a friendly amendment. Move that ordinance number 1135 have been considered by the council to be voted on for passage prior to its final adoption. Second. Motion to second on ordinance number 1135. Further discussion? Seeing none, would the council please vote? And will clerk please tell us what that vote is? Passes with four, one abstention. Very good. Next, we've got a public hearing on the budget amendment. Did we publish the appropriate public notice, Matthew? Yes, Your Honor, it's published in the Des Moines Register on May 10th, 2023. Very good, Liz. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, what you have before you this evening is the annual process where we amend the budget as it was adopted 18 months ago. Um, in the memo, I outlined um, all of the changes that we have made, um, and I would be happy to answer any questions that you have. Any questions on that? Otherwise, I'd entertain a motion to close public hearing. Move resolution. No, no, no. Close public hearing. Oh, sorry. Move close public hearing. A lot of rookies tonight, Mayor, I but know, right? uh, <laughs> I'm trying to get it. my first time. <laughs> motion to second to close public hearing. Before we do so, is there anyone in the council who wishes to address the council on this matter? Seeing none, would the council please vote? And will the clerk please let us know what the vote is? <laughs> Passes by a vote of five. So we've closed the public hearing. Move the resolution. Second. Motion and second to pass the resolution approving the uh, budget amendment. Further discussion? Seeing none, would the council please vote? And the clerk let us know what the vote is. Passes by five. That, that passes by a vote of five to zero. Thank you very much, Liz. Ryan, it's your turn to tell us about Ordinance 1134. I thought everybody was here for the building codes. I guess not. <laughs> <clears throat> Mayor, Council, thank you for your time tonight. Um, we're back in front of you for the six, second consideration for the building codes. Uh, Blake and I would just like to visit on a couple of conversations that we had at the public hearing regarding uh, emergency escape and rescue openings, and then also the short-term rental fees and kind of the structuring of that. Uh, since the last meeting and direction provided by you, staff has recognized that the adoption of a modern building code of which openings are large, okay, but it's easier on a new construction home. What we're getting into is we've got older housing stock that the implementation of a, of a modern code with these larger openings may not be appropriate for these um, areas of the city where um, perhaps building codes didn't even, didn't even exist when the houses were built. Additionally, we share the same perspectives as you regarding the finding a balance between the flexibility um, the safety and the economics portion uh, for the right fit for Clive. Uh, 1972 was the first year that we adopted our first building codes here in Clive. It was a 1970 UBC. That code indeed had emergency escape and rescue openings in it, and it was pretty robust for the time, time period. In fact, 
the modern codes of today, the 21 codes um, are very similar to what was um, established back in 1972 and adopted by council here um, at that time. However, homes constructed before 1972 didn't have a building code to really follow. So, you know, one could say it was maybe the wild, wild west out there. Um, we still have some really nice homes, um, older homes that are in impressive shape for how old they are. So um, we just wanted to provide some information for you tonight about kind of older homes and what comes along with older homes specifically when we're talking about um, the condition of a home, when the home was built without the benefit of inspections or code, uh, minimum code standards. And then also um, just kind of talk you through why we're being persistent on having a minimum opening size applied to uh, even the older homes in our community. So, Homes built before 1972, uh, they potentially missed out on important installations implemented to help slow the spread of fire within a home. So if fire occurs, um, there's some modern installations that uh, maybe didn't get installed in these homes. Those are to include specific fire resistant wall, ceiling and door materials, particularly between the garage and the house. Some of you may have self-closing doors that's there for a reason. It's a 20 minute door from the garage to the house. That provides a little bit of fire protection for the residents who are um, maybe asleep inside the home. Installation of fire blocking and fire stopping within walls, floors, attics, and ceilings. Uh, you wouldn't recognize that walking through a house because it's inside the wall cavity. Installation of firewalls and townhomes and other fire separation assemblies for two or more dwelling units under one roof. Those installations may have not been installed at that time. They were built before building codes. And enforcement of minimum fire separation distances on parcels. Um, we probably had some fairly strict zoning at that time. However, fire separation distance is a building related code that um, would adequately separate buildings on the same lot or on different lots. Additionally, these older homes that haven't been updated or adequately, adequately maintained may consist of outdated electrical systems, neglected wood burning fireplaces, minimal insulation values, which may call for the use of space heating appliances, outdated non-working smoke alarms, unbodied corrugated stainless steel tubing. And then finally, two smaller windows to support emergency egress or ingress in Blake's case. Uh, Blake's got a couple other facts just to present. So just to try and illustrate the point of why these emergency escape rescue openings are so important in the bedrooms themselves. Um, this data comes directly from the US Fire Administration that pulls it out of the National Fire Incident Reporting System, which we all use, all of all the fire departments across the country's <coughs> data from every fire they go to goes into this system. So annually in, these, in this three year period from 2017 to 2019, uh, annually there's an average of an estimated 2,770 civilian fire fatalities. Of those, 77% of them occur in residential buildings. Um, and 50% of those, uh, 50 of those victims were found in the bedroom. Um, additionally, 37% of those victims were determined to be trying to escape at the time uh, they succumbed to the fire. So whether they were trying to go out the front door because they couldn't get out a bedroom window or didn't think to try and go out a bedroom window. Um, they were found somewhere in the path of egress trying to get out of this building. And that's where they died. Uh, so that that's just to kind of try and illustrate that point to you, um, why it is important to have these rescue openings that we can get in. Um, it's about a 50-50 whether fires happen during the day or during the night when people are sleeping. Um, and when we do 
when we get a call for a structure fire in the nighttime, we do and train on what is we call a targeted search where we will go directly to the bedrooms first because we know that's where the majority of victims are found at nighttime. Um, so while one crew is attacking the fire from maybe the front door, we will go through windows to try and find the victims in the bedroom and get them out. So the reports have shown that these older homes, they do pose a greater risk of fire when a fire starts. And when the fire starts, it can spread quickly in these older homes, uh, leaving occupants trapped in rooms or other spaces. Uh, with these provided facts, um, you know, collectively fire department building staff, we feel it's important to have a minimum requirement for even the houses that were built before modern codes were, were applicable. Um, so what we are requesting is, um, or what we are recommending is one replacement window in each bedroom shall provide a minimum net clear opening of four square feet. Same from the first <laughs> presentation at the public hearing. The only thing we got rid of is, remember we talked about the glass meeting 5.7. You've got an opening of four, the glass. We're just going to focus on the opening. So we haven't changed that dynamic. The four square feet. Four square feet comes in all different sizes. Blake does have a frame here. You can kind of show you. What is that a? So that is the minimum width that would be allowed on any window is 20 inches. So that's how narrow that window is. And to you get your four <coughs> square feet, then that window would have to be 28.8 inches high. So that that is a four square foot opening right there. Obviously, you can adjust that a little bit, the, the minimum height is 24 inches, so it could be two by two square, um, but that, that is a rough estimate of what, what type of opening we're talking about. It's not a very big opening at all. And just to give you an idea of what it looks like when we go through an opening like that. Lieutenant Glendy volunteered today while they're doing <laughs> training mm. uh, to try and demonstrate that. Going through this opening right here, uh, as you can see, he takes up most of it with his gear on. He's a pretty slender guy, and even for him to get through, he had to turn his shoulder sideways to get through that opening. Um, takes up a bunch of space. And another thing to consider is that if we're going in this window, there's a chance that, or if someone is standing out of this window trying to wait for us to get to them, there's a good chance that hot smoke and gas is going out the top of the window. So if they have a smaller window that they're taking up the entire window, they're getting burnt with hot gas and smoke as it passes them um, going out. So there needs to be a big enough opening that can allow both where somebody could get down low, still have good air below them, but still let smoke out the top. Impacts. So Amanda graciously did a, a GIS search for us. Um, we've got roughly 602 single family houses that would fall um, in line with not having a building code when the house was built. That's roughly 12% of the overall housing stock within the city. So the four square foot number would be applicable to these homes only in a replacement window situation. Windows that exist today would be allowed to exist today until they came to a situation where they wanted to change them. Now, the key to this is public education. You know, we've got to reach out to the community. We've got to provide information. We've got to be, be willing to help these folks um, create a design or a plan to achieve four square feet, but also think about the design of their home. Help them pay for it too. We're going to have to help them pay for it, right? So you're talking about a neighborhood. I understand all your your statistics and all, but you know it doesn't talk about how many are dying coming out of a window and all that. I'm not against the safety piece. I'm not against the fire discussion and all that. But you're talking about a neighborhood that we're been spending hours and hours about how do we get them to reinvest in their homes, and they bought in these neighborhoods. Um, so I'm hoping the city will be ready to do what we've talked about 
and also put up some grant monies to this entire neighborhood through community development, maybe part of their budget, um, that we take some of that money and give it out to develop to some of these homeowners. But that's a big investment with windows. And you're changing, you're talking about changing entire. So I, I guess I'm a little that we're coming back at this in the same fashion uh, again. Mm -hmm. Uh, without the consideration with education. Education won't get these folks to reinvest, right? Real dollars that matter today. I guess the question I have, I mean, this was pre-code, but we don't know that each house does not have a window that is at least four. Right? You're correct. We did, um, so I went out and evaluated some of the flood buyout houses that we have um, on the books. And the two that I looked at, one had egress compliant windows that would fall in line with actually the modern codes, um, and one did not have it. So yeah, there are going to be some properties out there that do meet the, the four square foot requirement. Um, but yes, there's going to be others that won't meet it. And, you know, um, regardless, I think um, anything about life safety is is, you know, it's good to educate because part of any um, life safety plan or evacuation plan in a house is identif identification of egress window or another way out. So, you know, as we educate our public and start talking about um, these plans, you know, egress window, People may not know what that's about until we tell them. And four square feet is not that large of an opening when it comes down to um, a window replacement. They can, there, there are options out there. If, if they're in the market to replace windows, um, we have a lot of folks who would just go directly to a casement window. They maybe have single hungs you know, in there right now, they would just make the move to a casement window because they want to see the largest opening in their kid's bedroom. That's their choice. They wouldn't have to reframe that, <clears throat> restructure that header. They wouldn't have to reframe that opening. That is just a choice. And, and perhaps some of the education, we've, we've been educating people on egress windows, even though we don't have an inspection program for that or a permitting process for that yet. We've been educating folks. We've got um, cheat sheets. If you walk into our community development office, we've got a cheat sheet that talks about, okay, if I need a, a window of this size and I've got a framed opening at this and I don't want to reframe it, how tall does this window have to be? So we provide that information to them. Yeah, but are those going to be custom casement windows? Um, or I'm struggling with that idea. I mean, I like the idea of the, uh, just replacing with a casement, but are, are those going to be different than what, you know, Anderson or Pella or whoever does for their typical casements, or are they going to have to custom? Because then you're, you're back, you're back at exactly what Mike's saying, additional cost, because I've got to do a custom size window. Yeah. Well, um, so yeah, uh, custom, custom windows, uh, casements do come in custom windows. I mean, just like, um, you know, single hung window wood as well. But most of these houses are typically framed at a nominal size that would accept a standard size window without a lot of change to that window frame, the existing window. For instance, 24 by 36, um, you could go around, there's a lot of homes that just have that as their standard size. But yes, there may be some situations in the existing housing stock where a custom window would be required. Um, but the change, the drastic change is the opening size you get when you go from a single hung to a casement. So even, yeah. even if you have to go down to the next size smaller in a casement window, more, you're more than likely going to meet the code of four square feet. What about, Ryan, what about a, a basement window that they've got a bedroom down there and they want to replace that? It's a small small window and it's surrounded by concrete block. Does yep. it meet that standard? I mean, what kind of cost are we looking at? Are they going to have to knock block out? That's, that's, a big, that's a big project. Well, even today, that small little vent window 
is not an option for egress. It never has been. So if folks are using it as a bedroom, we've, we've seen it in re uh, rental units because we're in those. We've seen it in rental units. When we identify that, it's an immediate, this cannot be a bedroom, you've got to vacate this room, or you need to come up a plan with a plan for the installation of a um, appropriately sized egress. egress window. Yeah, those aren't considered bedrooms. Typically. Yeah, so um, in some cases, yes, we've had uh, foundations have to be cut to be able to put in egress windows, but it's, it's their choice. You know, if they want a bedroom down there, the bedroom needs to have an egress window. And, um, you know, there's some alternatives, fire sprinkler systems installed in residential houses. Um, if you got a bedroom down there, you install some heads inside that bedroom, technically, uh, you wouldn't have to have an egress window. Now this is basements only. Uh, you wouldn't have to have an egress window down there. But in general, most people aren't gonna install a sprinkler in their system unless they've got a very large house and the code would dictate that. You're getting your money's worth out of your legal counsel tonight. I'll, I'll just mention, um, oh my God, here we go. Um, on the point of education, you might consider education about um, grant programs. I think there's a program called ARP. It's about American like, oh, here, I'm, I'm totally stepping in your lane right now, Chiefs. Um, fire rescue, like when you can, you can get grants to improve your, house it was passed there was an act i think it's called section 504 if you look at it it was passed in 2021 that allows people grant money to improve for fire safety reasons specifically so you might want to take a look at that because i think that's what council member mccoy is getting at and maybe council member weaver is if they're they're all for it but they need a pathway to get it done and perhaps the federal statute and the i think it's to the state of iowa like department of agriculture is a team member of that so maybe take a look at that as a as a pathway and a ramp um, mm -hmm. as part of your education yeah mm -hmm. my biggest concern here is this housing stock generally speaking what you're talking about are folks that are going to be on the lower income end to begin with. And so mm -hmm. now we're going to be adding additional costs. To, I get what everything you guys are saying. I get it. Right. And it makes sense. And, and I'm not, I'm not discounting that in any way. I'm just thinking about the individual homeowner who wants to replace their window. And now you're going to add, I don't know what the cost is, but 50% more or whatever it is, that's going to mean a lot to them. And that, um, and, and from their perspective, it's just government regulation of, you know, you're making me do this. Um, and they don't understand it. Um, so that, that's really, you know, when we go to sell a house, we don't have to bring homes up to code. It, it, it's just not a requirement because if we did, we'd never sell a house in the city of Des Moines. It would never happen. <laughs> right. So, um, so I, again, I get where you guys are coming from, but I'm really struggling with um, what, what we're gonna impose on individual homeowners. You know, maybe if there's something where, if someone's doing a remodel, and I know Doug's got the, the, the computations for how you compute what's a remodel versus just, you know, an update, um, then by all means, let's have this in place for a remodel. But if all I'm doing, my, my brain dead teenager throws a baseball through the window and I got to replace it, well, you know, now I'm adding all this extra cost and that, yeah, that bothers me. Right. Yeah. No, I get, I get your concerns. I mean, so the repair, the repair side of thing is, is it going to be considered differently? The existing building code would speak to that the repair would allow somebody with a broken window just to replace it. Like for like, um, the commitment of this four square feet is, you know, it, it would be, um, for the folks who wanted to do the replacements in their homes. And again, um, the existing rough openings um, that exist there, um, they would support, they're gonna support a standard size window to, to create this four square foot of opening. Um, the city is, we have no ambition to go out there and seek out houses and make people change windows. Well, that, that's not our mission. Right. The mission is if we're gonna change out windows and we've got an opportunity, just like we do with electrical systems, when electrical systems are dated, they've got um, panels that maybe have been um, federal Pacific. recalled or something like Zinsco and, and some of the other panels, Federal Pacific. 
Um, when they come in to do a, a panel change out, we've got a whole list of things that they need to update. GFIs, smoke detectors, those types of things, those cost money as well. Um, what we're looking at is just another component of life safety for the, for the residents. We hit on smoke alarms last week, the interconnection piece. Um, this really goes hand in hand with that, that detail. Um, Brian. At the end of the day, uh, you know, I, I don't have a dollar and dollar and cents, you know, I could work it up, but um, at the end of the day, there's not going to be much cost difference to meet minimum standards as long as the residents are okay with accepting a window that may be a little bit different on the back side of the house than the front side of the house for that, for that bedroom. What would your estimate be, Ryan, for the cost differential from a basic replacement to conforming with the four by four window? Just ballpark, 25% more, 50% more. Absolutely not. We're talking four to $500 on maybe a four to $5,000 investment. So you'd be looking at 10% maybe. And is the exterior change at all of that window? So from my window today to the window I'm putting you're changing in. changing the frame, it could. I mean, you're going to have to change the siding. and That's right. That's, that, the mean. siding is going to change. And if I've got vinyl siding, now I'm doing new siding and you just... And, and today, if I did windows, do I have to pull a permit? To do a window replacement? No. No. No, that That's no but we adopt, so just to, just to inform you, we adopt codes to protect the city with all sorts of things that we don't have enforcement on. Roofs. You, you won't believe the amount of roofs we get um, through hailstorms and other things where we get calls from insurance agents What's the minimum code here in Clive? So we'll draft a letter. I've got a whole bank of, of letters that we send to the insurance companies. We still have a code you have to meet. It's a minimum standard. We adopt that. We don't have a permit or an inspection process for that. But Ryan, I, I have a question about those, something you mentioned earlier. Um, situations, the codes, in my mind, are an investment in our community. Folks are, folks are safer when they follow the code. I mean, we could, we could go all day about, you know, how these codes improve communities. That's what this is about. I that though, right? So yeah. I, I, we're just, it, I'm just trying to balance the, the, the whole picture of this. I, no yep. one's questioning the need for the codes, absolutely. So, so Ryan, do you have Ryan, anything you further to present? Me? No, not on egress windows. I do want to say a couple things on the short-term rental bit because we had some conversation about that. Um, so we, we heard you last, last meeting, you talked about wanting to um, be able to charge for short, short-term rentals. We're mid-year in a cycle right now. Um, the way our current rental program works is we're on a registration system. So what that means is every two years, an order, owner of a rental property comes in and re-registers that property. They do their self-inspection, they sign an acknowledgement form, and then they pay their um, registration fee every two years. The only time we would charge differently is if we have more inspections than the standard. You know, we go out and do the audit inspection. One re-inspection is built into the, the cost of that. If we have additional issues and have to make multiple visits, we have the, the means to be able to charge them for that. Now, state preemption, they don't allow you to charge any type of permit fee, registration fee for short-term rentals. Um, however, we do, at the time where we, we evaluate the six-year program, that's coming to, we're gonna start that process in 2024, the start of the new, um, Calendar year of 2025 is going to be the start of the new rental cycle, so to speak. And at that time, we will evaluate if um, the short-term short-term rental bit is um, needing to be evaluated to charge for those short-term rentals, inspections, and the administration side. So we we did hear you. It's just very difficult to um, send out 200 letters to rental owners and kind of let them know we're we're looking to switch gears here part of the way through a cycle. Um, but we do have that on our task list to review when we get to that point. 
Okay, thank you. Um, I think the council member McNally is trying to oh, ask a question sorry. about if his audio is coming through or not. Shrika, you have a can, question? Yeah, can, can you hear me? Or maybe not. Councilman, we've lost your audio. Uh, One moment, Your Honor. Well, while we're while we're waiting, I'll just comment. I I think this is the right direction to go. Uh, I'm hoping that the impact will be minimal. I mean that there'll be a number of these properties where if you're going in and spending thousands of dollars getting new windows, it shouldn't be a big deal on most of the properties to have one of the windows that's going to have be able to allow a firefighter in. But Mr. And Mayor, we'll I, I'm sorry. And uh, I agree that part of the education should include the wind, the Anderson windows and others, uh, make sure they're communicated if this passes so that they're aware of it so that they can easily come up with a proposal for homeowners. And also our education does need to include these multiple types of grants that, that are available to help offset the costs mm -hmm. for fire safety. I mean, that's, it was a great point from legal counsel to look into that. So I think it's all encompassing to make our citizens safe. I mean, the last thing you want is somebody stuck someplace in a fire. So do we have Shrikant yet? Yeah. Or does council want me to keep talking? Okay. <laughs> Let's see terrifying. if we can do it one more time. It appears the councilman is trying to speak, but. If I could Council Member McCoy, while we're waiting. Yeah, if I could get a clarifier, are we talking, when you guessed, I know it's a guess, uh, $400 for that window, a difference, right? Yeah. Uh, per window? No, 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 no. That'd be total. Just say that. Remember, egress windows aren't every every window in the house. We're talking about one per bedroom bedroom. window. So how many would that be, $400? So, so the $400 increase? So for that project, I have to have one upstairs at all? I got one three per bed bedroom. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So and if you've that, got a two bedroom, you you're going to have one in each bedroom. Right. Each each bedroom has to have it. And that's still only four hundred dollars. Yeah, I'd, I'd say probably two hundred bucks per window. Yeah. I just pulled up Menard's website. So say you bought your own window. I took um, same yeah, right. brand, same dimension, same quality rating. It was a thirty five dollar difference from the single home to the casement. But that's without reframing. Yeah, well, in that situation, either would require the reframing because they're the same size window. So just to help that, was 35 bucks if you did it yourself kind of deal. I, I think if you're committing to a window replacement, it should be known that you're going to have a little bit of that because most folks, if you're going to, it's a balance, right? If you're going to do custom size windows so you don't have to do that, you're going to pay for it. Most folks like to go to Lowe's or Menards or some of the box stores by the the standard size windows, and then they're going to pay for it on the back end because they're going to have to do some siding work, some drywall work, some trim work. So there's going to be a cost associated either direction that you go. It's just how, um, yeah, how you get there. Your Honor, I have Councilman Michelinani has texted or has chatted oh, his please. question. What's the question? <laughs> Councilman writes, my question is about replacement versus repair. Would repair like for like be limited to an insert or would a full replacement be allowed? If it's the latter, how do you determine when a replacement uh, when a replacement requires desired? I'm not sure there might be a typo there. <laughs> oh, I assume he can still hear us. Yeah. Okay. So the, re the repair is going to consist of a glass break. So if you're going to pull the glass out of the frame or the sash around the window, Okay, if you're going to replace that, the sash remains the same. That's going to be repair. At the time that you remove that sash and the glass, then you've got a replacement. The remainder of his question there, if it's the latter, how do you determine when a replacement requires desired, uh, when a larger opening replacement is required? So it's gonna be based on the requirements for egress windows. So if it's not a bedroom window, you, you know, you can do what, what you wanna do with it. If, if it's not a, a required egress window, most folks are either gonna just replace the glass, the sash, do whatever they need to do to make that window 
uh, match the rest of the windows. If it is a if it is a bedroom window and they've got to do, uh, and that is the the egress window for that bedroom, and they've got to do a replacement in there, then yes, they would have to meet the minimum code on that. Thank you. Other questions, comments, or discussion? What we're looking at this evening is the second reading on Ordinance 1134. I just have one comment, yes. and that is I think that photo was really compelling on why it's a good idea to have a minimum width of 20 inches and the four foot or four feet square requirement. So I support it. So I'll just make one quick comment. Um, I'm, I'm hesitant still on this. You make a lot of really good points and um, you know, the, the fact that we can hopefully minimize the scope of it to just one bedroom window. Um, and we're not talking about a, a lot of other windows so we can at least minimize that to a certain extent. So I will hesitantly support it. <laughs> Thank you, Ted. You know, I'd, I'd move that ordinance number 1134 have been considered by the council to vote on for passage prior to its final adoption. Second. Motion and second. Further discussion? Seeing none, would the council please vote second reading? And will the clerk please let us know how the vote falls? That passes four in favor, one against. And the one against was Mr. McCoy. And hopefully the council will rethink that neighborhood and the, the program to put in place because what you just are about to do is is ask them not to improve in their houses if they're worried about all uh, the hoops without the education without the money all that stuff it's 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 going to discourage them to do this so hopefully they, the the staff will come back with some as i requested the first time to come back with some plans on what we do next um, and how we help fund the housing stock in that area that we've already discussed in strategic planning and other places that we're worried about. Amanda has even had a program on this. Doug has even had a program. And now we put extra uh, expenses on these same owners, owners that we still have no answer to, uh, even in the uh, insulation piece, uh, uh, the other pieces and the upkeep pieces, like I've been discussing for maybe eight years with Urban Dale's program and the reimbursements, and uh, but we yet still continue to put prices on. Um, also, I'd ask for before the third reading that uh, uh, the, the two gentlemen come in with how many of those 37% that died in the bedrooms died in bed versus trying to crawl out of a window. Uh that's actually on here. Thirty-seven percent of them were trying to escape. Thirty-one percent of them died in bed. Thirty-one percent. So the window had nothing to do with the deaths. Of, of thirty-one percent. So about nine hundred. Thirty-seven that were trying to go in the egress. No, that's a separate number. Thirty-seven percent of the total were trying to get out. We don't know how, right? But right. Yeah. And thirty-one percent were in bed. Well, Mike brings up good points, but, um, you know, one of the things we have talked about and looked at and, and we haven't finalized, but is NFC as well. And, um, you know, I've had some conversations with NFC and getting that area uh, qualified for some NFC grants to do exactly this kind of stuff. Right. And so there's there is money out there if we want to support that from NFC to allow homeowners to improve their home and do things like replacement windows so and then i'm fully supportive yep, of it yep. right but to put more on them without these right. first let's do the nfc first and then couple with hitting them with a hammer of saying you owe more on the prices that they right now can't even afford and updating their house i think it's a it's a good topic for strategic planning that we can i i, I, I agree and I, I share your concern with that too you know working on the discipline plan i look it, we're kind of putting the cart ahead of the horse a little bit here <clears throat> i think you know, there are programs out there. We've been talking about this for a number of years. I think we need to make, turn that into reality though. And in some form, let's, let's get it started. Let's get the ball rolling with that. Mike, I, I do just want to make one 
point. I, I appreciate your, your feedback. Um, <coughs> so folks who are looking to replace windows, remember we, we've got the one egress in the bedrooms. Um, you know, perhaps in my education piece, if I was working with a homeowner that had um, financial, you know, financial situation where maybe they couldn't afford to do them all at once, I would encourage them to do the ones that they could afford first, save for the ones that they can't. We would help them with the design or the sizing of those windows so they knew what to plan for and save for. I mean, these folks, they, they face the same thing when they have to buy a different vehicle. You know, we're here to help them through that process. And if it's one window at a time, we're going to continue to help them. It's an investment. I truly believe that in both yeah. of you and in both departments. But again, I think Eric said it first is the best is the cart before the horse. And let's let's maybe implement this once we implement something we've been trying to implement for 10 years. And that's that piece, a robust education process, a grant process, and all this, then kick in. The, the the pieces like this that are going to cost them more, right? So, mm -hmm. uh, two hundred to three hundred, four hundred dollars to some of us up here isn't a big deal. To some, uh, it will be a deal breaker. Um, it's just the reality of it. Yeah. Very good. Thank you. A very robust discussion. Thank you, Rick. You're back up here. All right, this is the last time. Uh, bringing before you a revised uh, 20 agreement with the city of West Des Moines for Station 22 that's been out at essentially Country Club Boulevard and University for uh, just over 30 years. We're really on the tail end of, of three changes um, that we've made. One is we're coming up on the end of a five-year agreement with West Des Moines where we changed from a joint ownership model to a contract for service. So they've been buying us out of our ownership share. Uh, station 43 with Urbandale came on board. Um, that station was designed and programmed to cover essentially the Dallas County uh, portions of both cities. And Station 32 has relocated a little bit further to the west and certainly has a lot more coverage uh, being up on Hickman. So with those changes, um, we ended up having overlapping coverage. Um, station 22 was overlapping into areas that, um, that 43 can cover and overlapping into areas that station 32 can cover. So as we looked at that and realizing that in some areas we're essentially double paying for that, it's not a good, not a good financial model knowing how those responses were shaking out. Uh, we negotiated, uh, staff negotiated with West Des Moines, let's reduce our reliance on station 22 and keep their response between the interstate and 142nd. And then there's that small area of Clive that, that kind of juts into Waukee, their university at 142nd, two cul-de-sacs and a commercial building. So with that, um, it essentially cuts the calls in half for station 22. So what we've negotiated with them is um, our costs go from uh, roughly $950,000 a year to 500 dollars um, 550 to $600,000 a year. So it's, we're expecting about a $400,000 a year savings. Um, with that, we, um, we negotiated a 5% cap. You know, there's some things that are outside of our control on the, the operational cost with West Des Moines, but they were agreeable to saying, we'll never raise it more than 5% of what it was last year. Um, they have, um, the, change their model and the way that they want to do some intergovernmental agreements. Uh, similar to the way Westcom has been done, there's some indirect cost for their staff, their, their legal time, their administrative time, those types of things that are integrated into this agreement. Um, one of the capacity things West Des Moines is wrestling with is uh, they, don't, um, they don't have the time to do fire inspections uh, in that area. So station 32 is going to absorb those. Uh, but we got some further uh, cost considerations uh, because fire inspections won't be done. Basically, we converted those hours into cost per hour and have a deduction off the total cost as well as a deduction off of those indirect costs. So the response area was 
uh, kind of more my idea. Matt was the chief negotiator, so you can give him credit on that end. But uh, happy to answer any questions you have. Um, I will say West Des Moines passed this on um, May 15th and ready for us, pending any questions that you have. Questions. Otherwise, we just need a motion on the resolution. Move a resolution. Second. Motion and a second for the discussion. Seeing none with the council, please vote. And with the clerk, please let us know the vote. It passes five in favor. Very good. Next, Amanda is back up here talking about rear yard setbacks. Good evening again. Um, so staff has identified a general neighborhood challenge for the community um, with the changes in how people are desiring to use their outdoor spaces. Um, we think that's um, largely the driver here as we've seen a significant uptick in requests for these kind of rear yard changes um, since March of 2020. Uh, <clears throat> sorry, my allergies have been flaring up, so apologize. Um, so since March 2020, um, we've had eight residents submit a variance application for converting an existing deck to a covered deck. Um, the challenge we run into with a lot of these requests is that the covering uh, puts a roof on it, which then becomes an addition to the home. Um, the way it all structurally ties in and is developed that uh, meets the building code requirements to be considered an addition where a non-covered deck would be just an accessory structure. So um, a covered deck has to meet the same setback, which is typically a 35 foot rear setback as the primary house would have to meet. Um, a deck on the other hand would just meet our accessory structure setback, um, which would allow you to go to, I believe it's five feet on accessory structures. Um, so what we have is a lot of homes that have existing decks that are perfectly fine and placed as they can be. Um, but then when those homeowners come forward and want to make those improvements to their property and enhance the values, um, they are frequently come up against that they are not able to do so because of the setback requirement and that becoming um, an addition to the home. So what um, staff would like to bring before the council is um, a conversation about whether we should bring forward um, just kind of a one-off amendment to the zoning ordinance to specifically address rear yard setbacks um, to give additional flexibility to our residents. Um, the variance process, one, um, it involves a lot of staff time. Uh, we, that those, these requests involve um, Kelly, our administrative, um, one of our building inspectors, or Ryan is almost always involved in these requests um, before it gets to planning. And then uh, myself, or once we fill the vacancy, the other planner um, have a lot of time involved. That's not just our time, though. That's also our residents' time. And there is a $275 application fee that's associated with the variance, um, which is can be um, a bit of a hurdle for some families if they've put their budget together. You know, as we were talking about with increasing costs, the same kind of logic would apply here. Um, and what we find is these variance requests are almost always approved and not really um, a neighborhood concern. Uh, and staff would also argue that a variance request that we see with this level of frequency um, and is always getting approved is really not an appropriate mechanism to be addressing that. That really falls into a code revision is needed by the city council. Um, so we would like to get clarity on if council would like to see this additional flexibility added into the code. Staff will go forward then um, over the next month and prepare that um, and bring forward to you to set public hearing and go through the plan and zoning process on an amendment of that nature. Um, or we could bring back discussion about options for what that amendment could be. Um, it wouldn't necessarily have to be a reduction to the entire rear setback. You could allow 20% of the facade, 50%, 30, kind of whatever number um, that the council was comfortable with for that, that would allow these kinds of covered deck additions. Or as we look at some of our older housing stock, you know, bump outs for a kitchen addition that would accommodate your, your more modern amenities like a pantry or an island, 
Um, these are the kind of challenges we've been running up against. Uh, this was identified in the housing reports um, and presented to council at that time as one of our action steps of a recommendation we could do uh, to help alleviate some of the challenges with reinvestment um, due to just staffing challenges and the amount of new development projects we've been managing the last few years. Staff has not been able to comprehensively uh, rewrite these residential district chapters. Um, but this one item um, staff feels could be addressed in a very simple yeah. amendment that would remove a lot of these barriers and um, kind of create a more level playing field for our residents across the city rather than going through that um, variance process. Sounds good. Any objections? Go ahead, Ted. No, no objections. So um, yeah, it's kind of a no brainer, but I guess my one question, at least in my mind, uh, my one question is, is there any downside to doing this that you see? I mean, there it's a perception potential of a downside. So um, this would, as I said, it's a level playing field. So now anyone that would be a resident would be able to come in and get a permit and build to whatever this new revised <laughs> setback is. That would be new construction. That would be existing construction. Um, I should say it wouldn't necessarily impact our PUD zoned areas um, as this would be in the zoning ordinance for the R zoning districts. Um, so a PUD would have to go through their typical amendment process to make those changes. So a lot of like the Shadow Creek area wouldn't, wouldn't fall under this. Um, but those homes are frequently being built with the covered deck amenity since it's new construction. Um, but a level playing field doesn't <clears throat> sound like a downside to me. Yeah. So the downside then, sorry, <laughs> coughing a little bit, um, is to come back then and there's at least a perception that your neighbor would have less say over what you got to do with your property. Again, is that a downside? Right. That really depends kind of your views. Right. Right. Um, but I would argue that at a variance level, a neighbor not liking what you're asking to do would not rise to the level of being injurious, um, depending <laughs> on what it is. It can, but just because your neighbor doesn't like it doesn't mean it's an injury to them. So it's also not appropriate that a variance would be denied because one neighbor didn't like it. Um, that's not really the standard that should be being applied. Um, so that's kind of what we're seeing uh, with some of these challenges of having to go through the hearings and neighbors coming um, rarely if a neighbor objects. Um, we did have two uh, recently um, that had, uh, one was not really an objection per se. They just had some comments and concerns that they wanted to hear discussed at the meeting. Um, the other was a neighborhood objection um, just from I, one neighbor. I think I spoke to that seller. Yeah. From a real estate perspective, it's a no brainer. I mean, it, 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 it just enhan enhances the value of your home. Eric, you know, and I hear I hear about this fairly frequently too. It's what the citizens want, you know, especially after COVID, right there. And I think we need to listen to the citizens. And I, I agree. There's always, you know, somebody that doesn't like something. I mean, let, let, let's face it. But overall, the you know, I think the overall good in this is the ability to put money back in their homes, and again, you know, increase the value of it, and increase the livability. They'll stay here. A lot of people will stay longer if they can have the, that type of mm -hmm. entity a covered deck in their home. So we don't want that for real estate agents. I, I understand your parochial interest. Yet. The one downside I can see is reducing the sight line for neighbors of what you can see. So I'd like to at least understand how far we think we're open to extending it. And, mm -hmm. you know, the covered deck really made some sense, but then we talked about kitchen bump outs. So I think we're looking a little further. So I'd like to have a little bit better mm -hmm. understanding of what, what that is, because I think it could affect neighbors more significantly than we might have realized. So let's at least understand it. Michael. Yeah, could we discuss the windows that might be put in this structure? <laughs> no. save, save that for another night. Not required, Mike. No, thank you. <laughs> Freecon, do you have anything? You good? You there? No question. Can you, yeah, can can you text? You, Everything yeah. good? We can still try to have another technical difficulty. He just has no questions. No questions. It just, it just you support it. Are you supportive, Councilman, of this staff bringing back a recommendation? Wink twice. <laughs> Heart emoji. He has not replied yet. Councilman, are you supportive of staff bringing back a recommendation? Oh, you got four votes. He, so says, I he says, yeah, I agree with Susan's points that she raised, but otherwise in support. 
Great. Um, so then I'm understanding that you guys would like us to bring back some recommendation prior to setting public hearing and Absolutely. drafting. Recommendation change. options. Great. Absolutely. Yep. Yep. We'll get working on that and hope to have something back in front of you in June. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you. We'll move to reports. Pete. Your Honor, wonderful coverage of Chief Rowe's retirement program. Thank you to our media partners for telling that really fantastic story. This coming newsletter will be featuring a number of items in, in the mayor's uh, letter. Of course, one of the most important ones for folks that we don't want to surprise them about are the utility rate changes, not just the stormwater residential and the irrigation, but the sewer and the uh, solid waste collection as well. So all of that will be prominently featured and everybody can point back to that if you have questions. And anytime you have residents who have questions about the program, because it can get a little complex, go ahead and send them straight to me. I've dealt now with about 25 uh, households that have inquired about what their tiered residential stormwater rates going to be. We also now have a new video that kind of lays it all out for everybody, which I think is getting a, a really positive reception. I expect more communications once people see the, the new numbers on their bills. Coyotes, uh, we had some calls about coyotes that were happening kind of during the pup rearing time for those coyotes and a little earlier than that. Uh, we'll feature some information about that in the newsletter, but we've also built a page on the parks website specifically about how we deal with coyotes and it's consistent with the way that they are being uh, addressed in Grimes, Urbandale and some other neighboring communities. We're taking our direction from the Iowa <coughs> on that. Two fun campaigns that are on the horizon, one, Goats are back out in the green belt doing their work. People are, again, interested in where they're at and love going to visit with them. The story that the goats most immediately are going to help us tell is trail etiquette. And we've started working on some Burma shave style signage options to tell people to be thoughtful about how they use the trail when they're passing or when they are uh, managing their speed. A couple other fun things as well. So Richard, his team has done some really good work getting started with that and we will have more to share when we get to June. Could you elaborate a little further on how you came up with the text for those Burma Shave signs? At least the initial concept of the text started with going to chat GPT, telling it we wanted it to write in the voice of the green belt goats, and Richard deserves all the credit for saying, hey, let's, get, let's see if we can really test this thing. So it's writing in the voice of the green belt goats. We knew we wanted it to be a Burma Shave style campaign, so it's two couplets, one on sort of one, line on each sign and it needed to sort of have a rhyme that went along with it too and keep it in that playful spirit and it generated stuff that was oh, amazing wow. very passable <laughs> and with a little bit of tuning we can keep making it better it's a powerful tool we got i've been uh using it uh more and more to help get first drafts down on paper cool last thing thank you to congressman nunn who sent a very nice photo of some of us who were able to meet with him while we were all out in DC. That's more. I don't I guess we can hear from Srikant. Right. Can, can, can you guys hear me? Unless he wants to text a long message. <laughs> um, if you want to start typing now, we'll get back right. to it. He wanted to give an update on DART, but that's, he does not believe that's going to be possible via text. Um, send us an email. Now, there might be some information we can include in our weekly or staff. We could call somebody on a phone. <laughs> what? Does he have just, a landline still? Just saying. Uh, yeah, Councilman, if you do want to call me, I can hold your my phone up to the mic. While we're waiting for that technical connection, hmm. Ted? I have no report tonight, Mayor. Oh, okay, very good. Eric? Just briefly, the Mayor and I attended the uh, the ribbon cutting for the new fairway store on Hickman. Uh, it's a beautiful store. Encourage everyone to uh, to check it out. Uh, it was well attended. And fairway uh, uh, corporate executives are, are very happy with how things are, are, are proceeded, Clyde. That's it, Mayor. Very good. Move on to you, Susan. Well, I appreciated attending the Mayor's tree planting. So that was notable. And um, yesterday attended a field day on behalf of the Walnut Creek Watershed Management Authority and managed to really twist my knee in the process. So took one for the team. <laughs> Very good. Michael. I have no report. Thank goodness. Nothing from legal counsel. Matt, we'll go to 
Uh, just a few items, Your Honor. Uh, just a reminder, I'll uh, be leaving on vacation tomorrow for two weeks. Uh, Pete will be serving as acting city manager while I am gone. So if you need anything, be sure to reach out to him. Um, I will be out of the country, so out of contact and range. Um, also, just a reminder for the council, uh, uh, three weeks from uh, tomorrow, uh, we'll have the Food Truck Friday staff appreciation night. So just be sure we'll, we'll be starting our activities at about four o'clock with the staff, but that will continue into the evening into when Food Truck Friday starts with a, a friendly kickball tournament as well. So if any council members are interested in playing some kickball, we can join yeah. some teams. The rest uh, of us gonna... could twist our knees at that point right. too. I know, I shouldn't bring it up now that uh, Susan Good. mentioned that about the field day. Um, also wanted to mention, just kind of circle back a little bit with the council on the Horizon uh, Event Center, the Greenbelt Music Festival from last weekend. Um, just to kind of give a frame to uh, uh, for a new event, a new outdoor event. I know that the council heard uh, from uh, one particular person who was who was uh, quite vocal in their displeasure of the of the music itself. Um, but I would say, in the grand scheme of things, and I asked each department to to report to me and kind of what they heard. Very small number of concerns um, in terms of uh, noise complaints. We had a few mainly focused on Friday night. Uh, zero on Saturday. Uh, we did have the, the the emailed complaints from a couple folks. I know the council has seen a few of those um, uh, complaints, but outside of that, a few um, um, law enforcement calls just for um, a few minor items, but nothing significant. The weekend on the most for the most part went very well, um, and uh, they were able to raise. I think the number that we've uh, been shared about $8,800 for the Clive Community Foundation is at least what the initial number that we've heard um, that they were uh, raising as a part of that festival. So um, again, no, well, we, um, this council has seen one particular concern from a resident. I know some of you visited with that gentleman uh, as well uh, during the event, but in the most part from staff's perspective, we had a, a, a pretty good uh, low key evening in terms of incidents. Um, but definitely we'll be uh, interested in, in council's feedback uh, on their feelings because this was kind of a kind of a pilot trying this out in terms of an outdoor event. I know that the Horizon Center folks will be interested in your feedback and the city's feedback as they look to uh, potentially plan for another one next year. So I think that's going to be something that we'll want to think about over the next uh, month here. I think it will probably warrant uh, an opportunity to have the Horizon Center folks come into here and uh, after they've kind of debriefed fully from the events and perhaps present to the council on what, you know, what they saw from their end and for you all to ask questions and get feedback. But I, I do think there'll be a good opportunity for a feedback loop on that. And any num attendance numbers from it, uh, also business viability, you know, any, any word on that feedback there? I haven't heard anything specifically on that. Uh, I know Saturday was attended uh, a little bit better. The weather was better, definitely on Saturday, a little warmer on Saturday. Um, but no, we haven't gotten any specific numbers, but I think that's something we would definitely right. want to request and get some follow-up on. But did you have some? Ticket sales were um, just under 1,800. Oh, okay. Thank you. I will say from my house, which usually you can hear everything from Horizon Center, it was decent. Right. It, as promised, it wasn't the base. It wasn't, the, you know, we had dinner on the back deck and it was no different than if a neighbor was playing music in the backyard. So it was there, but I think it was appropriate. Very good. And we have a report from Shrikant. Go ahead, Kensman. You'll need to mute your machine at home. Yep. yep. Uh, hopefully, hopefully there's, there's no, no feedback, feedback now. now. You're good. Go ahead. Uh, so just briefly, um, DART did vote to uh, go back out and search for additional candidates. Um, so we are, we are there, there are additional candidates in mind, but the search associates have been instructed to go out and additional candidates. Uh, this is in relation to the CEO search, by the way. Thank you. Anything else, Srikant? No, that's it. Thank you for that uh, that update. Uh, do they have a, a do they have a plan in the interim? Will the interim keep being interim? Uh, yeah. So, um, yeah. 
the uh, NRAP of shares she's agreed to pay out for her uh, individual flag. Very good. Thank you. Your Honor, just uh, one more thing on my list too is uh, uh, the mayor, myself, along with uh, uh, Jeff and Jim from Public Works, met with some of uh, the board members from the Country Club um, HOA board uh, to talk about streets. Uh, I know I shared this with the council previously, and we outlined they, they wanted to get familiar with our process for prioritization and some concerns, um, uh, obviously, that they're wanting to share about streets in, in their particular neighborhoods. Uh, we shared and we plan to present back with council um, some additional evaluation work that staff has been doing since the winter uh, to really show you, again, how we fared over this last winter, where the conditions of the streets. We wanted to bring that back to you all. We've kind of given them a little bit of a high level feel of that we are seeing more advanced deterioration in those particular neighborhoods, Country Club, Country Club West, uh, than we would anticipate. Again, we've talked about this before. There is a, a, a unfortunate, not great aggregate mix with some of those streets when they were stalled originally. So we, uh, they are very aware of that. We reinforced that. We wanted to um, kind of pull a lot of data together <coughs> to provide that information. So we walked through that with them. We walked through with them the funding constraints because um, of course the question is, is where is there more money to do more street rehab work? Of course, uh, the mayor and I kind of walked through some of those constraints that we have and now new constraints that we have um, uh, from the legislature as well um, and kind of talked about the funding sources of those. So a good conversation overall. I know they were going to report back to their, um, they have like a newsletter. I know Susan's familiar with this, with the board uh, that the board has, it sends out to the neighborhood. Um, association and again felt like it was a good conversation but know that they'll be very engaged as those discussions continue and I know this is something the council talks about every year um, and we will continue to bring back information and kind of give you a lay of the land of where we're at uh, today and uh, potential options for the future so we'll continue with that that's all I have your honor thank you Matt just uh, two things from me I wanted to remind everyone of the civility a workshop that's going to be Tuesday at 4.30. Matt, maybe you can include a reminder in your yep, that'll be in notice there. that goes out. We'd like to have a good turnout to, that and see that everyone here is committed to civility. I hope everyone is. Hearing no dissenting votes, so I'll <laughs> assume that's correct. Uh, the other thing I wanted to uh, compliment our police department on was the police officers memorial service. Um, the chief spoke, the lieutenant spoke, and Kelly was on the organizing committee and did a fantastic job. So it reflected very well on the city uh, to have the event, and our officers did an outstanding job. So kudos to them for that. Anything else for the good of the order? Any correspondence? Seeing nothing further, we'll adjourn at 821.